our elders. This is a podcast that I recently started and I'm so excited to focus on discussion about um, our seniors, them aging in place, and what resources are out there, and then also just going over some strategies and um, some burdens that might affect our seniors aging at home. Um, so today, let's discuss some of the uh, 2023 Texas um, legislative priorities for our seniors. One of the issues or concerns that they have is the low pay for care workers. Believe it or not, the average um, dollar that is paid to a care worker is $8 and I think it says 11 cents per hour. If only my caregivers knew that. Well, in order to get quality caregivers, you have to pay a quality price. Um, and $8 is way less than the average um, for my caregivers. That is also one of the reasons why we give such good care and we have such good uh, staff out there representing Companion. But this isn't about Companion. This is about just how this is affecting um, care for our seniors. So, you can't expect to pay someone $8.11 an hour and go above and beyond and take care of um, elderly clients or disabled clients that are dependent on these caretakers. They are always going to want more. They are always, well, let me let me um, fix that because not, not everyone, um, there are some people that do it just uh, for pastime or for fun. So I don't want to try to label people that make $8.11 an hour as um, thieves and uh, lazy. Okay, but you also have to again be realistic if you're going to pay someone $8.00 and 11 cents an hour to take care of someone, you're going to get someone that is worth $8 and 11 cents an hour. So we really need to find a way to increase that pay. And I can say that the reason why I believe that the average cost is so low is because Texas Medicaid's reimbursement rate is extremely low. It's 16, I think, an hour. So what's going on is the agencies that take Medicaid, which are normally large corporations, are trying to make you know profit off of this. So they're going to pay almost half of what they are getting reimbursed by Medicaid. So I think in order to fix this problem of um, the lack of having caregivers out in the community would be that Medicaid needs to increase their pay and they need to reimburse. Uh, let's not wait 90 days. How can these agencies, especially small agencies, wait 90 days to pay or to make any money off of these clients. So they need to reimburse faster. I'm talking like the VA, like every week to two weeks, and they need to pay a much higher rate. That way we can have a higher quality level of caregivers. Like I said, I'm not trying to say that everyone who makes $8.11 um, an hour is lazy or incompetent, but again, someone who knows their, um, their qualifications and they are confident in the work that they provide, they're going to laugh in your face if you try to tell them $8.11 an hour. I know I would. So let's get out there and let's um, encourage our local government to Go up to um, the state and 
This is something important. We have to increase the rate of Medicaid reimbursement and it has to be done faster. That way more agencies will actually look into getting a contract with Medicaid. But just like myself, it, I, it would be more of um, chaos and put me more in a bind if I were to do that. So let's get active and um, let's uh, talk to your local um, senators and um, get going with that. Okay, moving right along. Um, AARP Texas sounds alarm on harmful long-term care ombudsman bill. We'll have to look more into that. An ombudsman, if you don't know, there's supposed to be an advocate that comes out and meets with the um, residents in a nursing home. Um, they're non-biased. They are there to be, again, advocate for the residents. And if they have any issues, they can report them to dads um, and, you know, uh, find a solution to whatever the problem is. So, um, we'll have to look more into that one. Next thing is Texans call for nursing home reform. Um, through petitions and surveys, AARP is hearing from Texans who want lawmakers to improve nursing home quality, which is why um, AARP Texas is urging support for the bill 1629. Um, I can tell you that the whole quality measures of a nursing home is a complete joke. Um, I've worked in nursing home as a social worker. Um, I even have my um, administrator's um, certificate. Uh, worked in marketing and sales into the nursing home. That I've been doing that. Um, I got my first job with the nursing home in 2010 i believe it's when i was in college i even did my field placements there for my social work undergrad degree so there's been a lot of changes since then and then now with covid but even the system before was completely broken and flawed um then there was new leaders that were put in place and they wanted to make sure that the care in the nursing home was um, better. And so they started doing these quality measures and the higher the quality measure, the higher the rating that you get. Um, I think that also goes back to reimbursement rates. Um, so you might get paid a little bit more if you have a um, higher uh, quality measure which I'm going to get someone on this podcast that I already have in mind um, to come and kind of talk to me about that and explain to me a little bit more about that. But what I can say and what I, what I do, what I have seen is that if you are basing a quality measure off of infection, so the less infections you have in a nursing home, the higher the quality measure you will, the higher star rating you will get. What does that mean to you? If anyone with a little bit of common sense, it's that one, A, they're not going to claim the infection, so there's going to be a lot of people that might have UTIs or um, let's just say UTI because that is very common with the elderly population. They're just not going to claim it or they're not going to treat it because it's going to deem them on their quality measures. Well, what is a nursing home? A nursing home is well, what qualifies you to go into a nursing home. For Medicaid to pay for you to go into a nursing home, you have to not only be financially um, meet these financial guidelines, but you have to meet a medical necessity. And if you don't meet that necessity, you are not going to be able to go into a nursing home and have Medicaid pay for you to stay there on top of your um, applied income, which is your social security check minus $60.
we won't go into all of that. But all I can say is that if these quality measures right now, if this system that they have in place is going to ding you, if you are treating an infection, then um, that needs to go. That would be something that I would immediately, um, instead of maybe dinging those for treating an infection, I think it should be the opposite. That yes, we've noticed an infection, we are um, treating the infection, and then monitor from then once the next infection, infection occur and get paid on that. Let's go and let's have some days in between from when the infection started, when it was treated, and then when does it happen again? So to me, that's that would be the way to address that. And um, another thing. Um, that bothers me when it comes to these quality measures is the medications that the residents are on. Um, if they're on a anti-psychotic uh, medication, they start wigging them off because that is considered a chemical restraint. Well, America, Texas, they have been putting these little seniors and elderly on this medication for probably 30 to 40 years. So for you to start pulling them off of that medication at this point is not going to help anyone, especially not going to help the resident. So I think that also needs to be just taken off or not even considered. Um, you know, if it were to be, oh, well, so-and-so is having behaviors and now we're going to put them on a new medication that's an antipsychotic. Okay, again, maybe have that be monitored and that be considered and the quality measures. But don't change grandma and grandpa's meds if they've been on Zoloft for 30 years or Xanax for 30 years and they are addicted. I don't think it's time to start pulling them off now when they probably are only going to live about two more years. I think that's the life expectancy in um, a nursing home. So that is to me um, useless and it's not fair and um, should be considered and left alone if they were on that medication before they came into the nursing home. Um, so those are a couple of things that I, oh, another thing too is, um, I don't know if y'all have ever looked and I might need um, Presley, my assistant, to Google this for me and see. But exactly in Texas, what is the, uh, what, how many residents can you have per CNA? And she's going to look up that for me. Eventually, we're going to have like a big screen so we can display it, you know, like Joe Rogan. But we're not there yet. It's at least one caregiver to every eight individuals served. During which time? During the day? Yeah. What about night? So she's saying that it is at least one um, CNA per eight. One licensed um, nursing staff person for each 20 residents at night. That's an LVN? Or just a CNA? Long-term care workforce. That's, it just says licensed nursing staff, so RN. RN, LVN, yeah. or a certified? Nursing assistant. Nursing assistant. So you need one per 20 residents. They're not considering the distance between each resident room. They're not considering the level of care each resident needs. They're not considering um, the different diagnoses. Um, so how can one person take care of 20 people that are medically deemed um, necessary for the state to pay for them to go to a nursing home? So they have uh, they, they cannot, it is not safe for them to be at home alone. They need the 24 seven care. So how can someone, I mean, it's, it completely contradicts itself. I mean, you cannot have one person taking care of 20 people 
who need the help and need the care right then and there. When most of the time falls in the nursing home, which again, ding, the quality measures, um, which is supposedly going to tell you how good of a nursing home this is. Most of those falls happen in the evening time when they're getting up to go to the bathroom. Well, of course they can't get up and go to the bathroom or they can't press the call light and um, expect for that one person who is taking care of 19 other people to get there in a timely manner. So what's gonna happen is um, Mr. Jones is gonna get up because he has to go. He can't hold it anymore because his bladder is 95 years old. So he gets up to go to the bathroom, he falls and breaks his neck. How about we not we increase um, the, let's not be okay with having one to 20. Let's, let's be okay with having maybe one to five. I think that's something that is actually more realistic. And also you have to consider too that some of these patients might be a two person assist. So, so then you're pulling another CNA off of the hall of somewhere else off of their 20. And so they're, they are taking care of one resident and there's left 39 is that right? Yeah, 39 other residents that are by themselves because this person needs two people to assist them to go to the bathroom. So that's probably another contributor to why the life expectancy when you go into a nursing home um, significantly um, decreases. Risk for infection, we don't, you know, we're not treating those. Risk for a fall, a fracture, and then just the depression and um, ever since COVID, all the changes in the nursing homes, um, it's just, it, it's really, really, really depressing and sad, and it's not what we as Texans should be okay with for our seniors that have put their blood and sweat and tears into our community. They should get the very, very, very best of care and we should have a higher expectation for that and that should be known. So those are some of the things that I feel like that need to be changed if we are ever going to get a better um, just uh, quality of care in a nursing home. Let's see, what are some other things that are going on in today? Um, okay, so what they're doing too in, in the new house bill, 795. This is good. Um, so back in 2021, Texas had this huge, massive snowstorm. And... Um, it was crazy. I actually had to go and get my stepdad and we brought him to our house. Um, we would have blackout electricity. So the electricity would come on for like 15 minutes and then it would go back off for a couple hours. We were lucky. Some places like in um, Dallas, they never got any electricity at all during like 48 hours or it wasn't enough to heat them up. So not only were we dealing with um, a crazy winter storm that us Texans are not used to, but um, we were we we were not equipped to handle it. We had you know there's homes without fireplaces. Um, there was 246 people that died, and most of them were older Texans. So we need additional action to protect our most vulnerable our our most vulnerable. Um, population for just in case it happens again where um, we are out of power what are we going to do not only in a time of ice storms but in the time of heat everyone is moving to Texas they love the Texas way they are again because of COVID and the way their states handled it a lot of people have lost trust in their state um, government, and so a lot of people are moving to Texas, which is only um, 
I don't know if Texas is ready for that many people to use our power. So that's something that we need to consider because with all, with, could we look up, Presley, uh, how, what is, um, what's Texas population expectancy by 2025 with all the new people moving in? They're putting up, they are having these developers come in and they are buying the land of Texas and splitting it up. And me and my husband, he's a uh, construction, he owns a construction company and he does a lot of dirt work and puts in roads and tanks, which um, lakes and ponds. And I was, I was asking him yesterday, because we went and drove out to a development that he just um, put a road in. And I was like, have you, has anyone ever seen something like this happen? I mean, this land has been here forever. It has been um, family farms forever. We're talking large acreage that is now being chopped up into these little um, five to 10 acre tracks. And uh, I'm just wondering if we are even able to, is the power, do we even have enough power to support that? Because we did it during the ice storm because 246 Texans died. And that's just what's documented. Who knows what the real number is. But um, not only does it, I, I feel like they really need to consider all these people that are moving here and how that is going to affect our um, backup power and if that's going to cause any future shortages. Did you, were you able to see what the... I only found one for 2040. 2040? Yeah. What? 40, 40 million. 40 million and what are we at right now? In 2020 it was 29 million. So, 29 million going to 40 million and people are not having children so that just... Uh, Puts, you, puts, puts it into perspective that people are coming and it's almost going to double our population and are we, are the utilities going to be able to protect our seniors? Um, another thing to consider is that one out of every five Texans will be over 65 in 2050. So by 2040, our population is going to just about double and one out of every five of them are going to be over the age of 65. So the baby boomer population is here and it is time to make sure that we are doing whatever we can to keep them safe, healthy, and of course at home. Um, Another House Bill 9 um, and House Bill 2662, they're trying to connect Texans, and we spoke about this in, in my last podcast, but they want to be able to bring high-speed internet to everyone in Texas. Well, I think they should come out to um, Indian Gap, Texas, or Energy, Texas, and these other very, very teeny, tiny, small communities that are filled with farmers and, and um, the elderly and try to figure out how to get um, internet over there. So, because I do believe that we have a whole population that is just going to be get, it's, they're being left behind because tech is moving so rapidly and um, we have a large percentage of our population that are not that are not able to advance with the technology or they're not even aware. They are not even aware of what's going on. And they might not be aware, but the thing is, is that like it or not, this is the way um, the world is moving. And so in order to ensure their safety and to ensure their health, um, then 
they need to have access to these things. So that's very, very important and um, it needs to be done. But I think again, um, the House and the Senate really need to be realistic and understand the um, our, our geographics and the distance between um, every senior, every Texan, and the and really grasp how big Texas is, and um, that needs that all needs to be considered. And we really need to make sure that those ones, first off, that again, the seniors are having access to it, but um, those rural seniors, those are the ones that, you know, we had one little, um, we had a person pass away because in Texas, when someone dies, especially in small towns, they put out little notices that's like, hey, Mrs. So-and-so passed away. They give a little thing about um, her, if they have their obituary on there, then they, um, it allows the community to know when the funeral services are. Have you ever heard that song, Everyone Dies Famous in a Small Town? Well, I believe that this contributes to that. But this one person that passed away um, wasn't found until almost four days later. So that's really sad. And that I feel like that is also um, contributes to the distance between each of our people that here in rural America. And um, also the fact that because of COVID, the we took such a long time just to talk about, what is it? What was the term you need to uh, social? Distance. Social distance. And that's really starting to bite us in the bum because we were, we groomed ourselves to social distance and then we forget about our neighbors, which again might be a thousand acres down the road that might be our nearest neighbor. Um, but I think it's really sad that we had someone that was deceased that was there alone for that long period of time and they just got left behind. So the importance of bringing this population up with technology is, um, is greatly needed, but also there's going to have to be a lot of training, a lot of education, and then we might have to call on Elon Musk to put up some different, come up with a different way to um, have internet that's actually, um, what is it? Is it high speed? Is that not fast speed? High speed? Yeah, high speed. Um, because the current Wi-Fi, again, I do not know a whole lot about this, but I think there needs to be more, um, what would be, what would be the way to have out so the, we can get the internet? Would be floating around in the universe. Um, not towers, but bigger than towers. I mean, I think we need more towers, but we also need like, maybe it is towers. It's something like with fiber, like fiber optic. It's like, some, I, it's something like, like dishes that. floating, di like, or dishes the old way. Yeah, I don't know. Cause I don't know, but there needs to, if we could figure it out, we would. So Elon Musk, we need you to bring internet to the aging population and rule um, Texas, calling you out, and I know you can do it because you're a genius. Um, oh, this is another good one that they wanted to talk about. We're off of connecting Texans, and we're moving on to the next um, the next topic of the agenda for um, AARP. Um, revising the SNAP vehicle asset. 
So, SNAP is um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's also known as food stamps. Um, but seniors that meet uh, a certain um, qualification financially, they are able to get benefits from SNAP. But it still takes in consideration if you have a vehicle. And I think whenever I was a social worker, well, I still am, but whenever I was actually um, helping uh, seniors get Medicaid, their vehicle had to be less than like 50, be worth less than $1,500. So, um, or that would affect them getting food or not, which is insane. And this should have been changed a long time ago. So I'm glad they actually know that it's an issue and they're fixing it because it does um, affect people from qualifying. So that's, that's good. Um, Dun, dun, dun. There, this is another thing that I think would be good to help with, um, they call it um, P APRNs, Full Practice Authority for Advanced Practice Nurses. Um, I'm pretty sure they're trying to what we're in Texas, we call this an LVN. Advanced practice nurse, or is that an RN, Presley? Or is that an LVN? I'm not sure. An we're not sure exactly what that's about, but I can say that there is a lot of LVNs and I feel like they should be able to practice, that's a licensed vocational nurse, they should be able to practice in other settings than just the nursing home setting because they have been LVNs for a very long time and they have the experience. Um, probably the most new RNs, well for sure they have more experience than them, but more um, hands-on experience. They are some of the best nurses and they should have a higher level of pay and they should be able to help in other areas than just the nursing homes. So, I don't know if that's what that's saying, but if it is, they're right on. If it's not, they need to jump on. You get what I'm saying? Then we got a picture of our capital, the top of it. Nice. Looks like a little angels up there in the cloud. Um, there's some other stuff that we could get into. Presley, how long have I been on today? I want to keep y'all's attention, so I don't want to go over too much, but you know I could talk for a very long time, especially... 33 minutes. 33 minutes. Yeah. That's pretty good. But an APN, advanced, whatever you said is a nurse um, who have met advanced educational and clinical practice requirements and often provide services in community-based settings. Hmm. So I guess it's different, because a CNA does that, kind of. Yeah, I don't know what that even means. They're always trying to change the term. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. They need to just let it be. Pay them more, pay the care workers more, pay the nurses more, because we have to invest in our caregivers because in year 2050, one out of every five Texans will need assistance because they will be at the retirement age, so their bodies will be changing, and we have to invest in the future. Um, there's some other stuff in here that I feel like is just... Access to medically tailored meals. Well, you can get... Humana provides frozen meals. Humana is a joke. Um, and they provide all types of different meals to keep people in hopes out of the hospital. Because once Humana 
um, patient goes into the hospital, they're going to be coming out real quick because Humana does not pay. Because they're buying frozen meals. Quit with the meals. And um, get them the care. Maybe, I think, putting Texas more responsible for providing meals um, would be great. I know here in Hamilton, we have uh, the community came together and they have created a great uh, resource for the seniors and people with disabilities. Um, they will provide meals to their hot meals, fresh hot meals. So people will donate, a business will donate um, meals one day and we have volunteers that go out and hand out the meals and um, they take care of, they bring food to a lot of people. And then it's also open in the community center where they can come. But it is not um, funded uh, by, used to be Meals on Wheels. It's um, more community involved. And that's because I think we've had several people in the community. Um, kudos to Lucy Lee and other supporters who have advocated for this. And... Um, has brought to light how many seniors there are and that nutrition is very important and we have to make it easier for them to receive these meals. And we need to hold our current um, businesses accountable and um, have pride into being able to provide a meal for our senior residents. So, um, I wish more people would have that mentality and really take pride in taking care of their neighbors and just the senior population in local communities and the disabled. Because providing a meal, you know, um, I think you have to. I think you have to provide a meal for like 150 people. And um, it real. I've done it before. Companions done it before. It does not cost much at all, and it just warms your heart. And um, it's kind of nice to have also put a little um, competition in the mix. You know what? Who did they sit? What? What were the? What was the talk about? Did Companion bring the best banana pudding? Uh, yeah, we did. So. Um, that's, they had a good dessert when Companion did it. And then you might have another company that will provide a dessert. And it's just, it just is the way it used to be. And it's the way it should be. And we need to get back into that instead of relying on, um, you know, these certain meals on wheels and stuff like that. We need to, we need to, um, just add more resources and take it take it into our own hands because we have pride in our aging adults. And it's also good for volunteers, for those who have recently retired to get out and about. It gives them a feel of purpose and self-worth and they are um, out delivering meals and it's just a good thing all around. So it hits every population to make you feel like you are, um, you have purpose. So, um, let's see, I think today that's what I'll pretty much wrap it up for today's, um, pod, Empowering Elders. Um, again, my name is Brianna Bullard and I'm the owner of Companion Senior Care and we are using this platform to discuss um, topics related to aging in place and resources for seniors. I'm so glad to have y'all and um, go do something special for someone else and y'all have a great day.